Uh, friends, colleagues, good evening, welcome. My name's Andrew Christie. I hold the Chair of Intellectual Property in this law school, and I also have the great pleasure of being the academic host for the Francis Gurry Lecture Series. Um, there are many of you here tonight, both in the room and online, and I give a very warm welcome to all of you. Those of you who are in the room with me tonight are on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. Those lands are unceded. The elders of the Wurundjeri people, past and present, have been the custodians of this great land that we're meeting on tonight. And on behalf of all of us, I pay my sincere respects to their elders. I also pay sincere respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here with us tonight. And to all people, all of us here tonight, I again thank you very much for your presence. Your presence actually is the most valuable thing you can give us. You're giving us your time, your attention, and your engagement with tonight's topic. And you will be able to engage with the topic tonight. Uh, we have good time available for question and discussion. When that time arises at the end of the formal presentation, what you'll do is you'll use your phone or other electronic device to scan the QR code, the Slido QR code, and from that you can then put your questions and they will come through to me and I will feed them to our speaker tonight. So uh, it's a case of keep your phones on but on silent uh, so that you can take advantage of that QR code when it's shown for you later. I'm very fortunate uh, many of you have, to know that many of you have been to a, one of the Francis Gurry lectures before, so I'll keep the comment about it very brief. You know, and I think most of us know, that the series was established in 2009, named uh, in honour of the law school's distinguished alumnus, the former Director General of the World Intellectual Property Organisation. And it's a joint event, a joint initiative of the Institute of Patent and Trademark Attorneys, IPTA, and Melbourne Law School. We have many IPTA members here tonight and we have IPTA representatives, councillors, including President Jennifer McEwen. We're able to run this event here and elsewhere in Australia and this year, uh, last week, we are in Sydney um, because this lecture series has very generous uh, and much appreciated support from its sponsors. You can see their banners here tonight uh, and I would just want to publicly thank them. AIPPI Australia, IP Australia, IPSANS and LESANZ. Each of those four organisations, and it straddles both Australia and Australia and New Zealand, have been supporters of the series from the beginning, and we're very grateful for that. So I now uh, invite to come to the podium to introduce our speaker, Jennifer McEwen, President of IPTA. Thank you, Andrew. I'm very, very pleased to be here tonight to introduce our speaker. IPTA is proud to be a founding partner and continuing supporter of the Francis Gurry Lecture Series. As Andrew mentioned, the Francis Gurry Lecture Series is supported by IP Australia, AIPPI, uh, IPSANS and LESANS. It now marks a unique collaboration of our country's IP office, one of our country's leading universities and a number of our country's not-for-profit IP organisations in delivering to the public an annual lecture on IP from Australian and international IP leaders. These lectures, in my view, serve to promote the increasing value of IP in the modern world and how IP can contribute to business growth and success something when nurtured organically and supported so that it can thr thrive and flourish and can also lead to better lives and outcomes for individuals and the communities they live in. This year's Francis Gurry speaker, Antonio Campinoche, who is addressing us on the topic of towards a sustainable patent system and society, took up office as the president of the European Patent Office on the 1st of July, 2018. With over 6,000 staff and of 34 different nationalities, Antonio leads uh, one of the largest public service institutions in Europe, which is headquartered in Munich, with offices in Berlin, Brussels, The Hague, and Vienna. 
Prior to his appointment as president of the EPO, Antonio was, uh, was from 2010 the executive director of the European Union IP office based in Alicante. Um, Antonio came to the EU IPO from the Portuguese National Institute of Industrial Property, where he held different executive roles. And he joined that office uh, in 2000 as a trademark director, and in 2005 was elected as president. Antonio holds a master's degree in public law and advanced European studies. He was awarded the title of uh, Dr. Honoris Causa from the University of Alicante, Spain in 2017. He was also inducted to the IP Hall of Fame of the Intellectual Asset Management uh, magazine in recognition of his significant contribution to intellectual property law and practice. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Antonio Campinoche. If you can't control your muscles, you can't express yourself, which is why paralysis is such a profoundly, impactfully horrible disease. We've developed a technology uh, called the Stentrode that can allow people with paralysis to control external equipment with their minds. The signal can't go to the body, so we bring the signal right out of the brain. I do think this is the beginning of something um, big. The, the first time I saw the Centroid working in a patient, seeing him control the computer with his mind was surreal and, and magical. Okay, good afternoon everyone and thank you for uh, the warm introduction, Andrew. Um, it's a pleasure to be as a guest of the University of Melbourne and the IPTA. And to say a few words in a lecture series that's become so respected over the last uh, decade. Uh, the video you've just seen tells the story of Thomas and Nicholas, who is also here, I think, this evening. So, hi, Nicholas. They were finalists from our European Inventor Award, uh, which took place just before the summer. And it's a story of overcoming challenge with a technical solution, of helping paralyzed patients to communicate with external devices. This is what can be achieved when creativity meets technology and what we so urgently need more of. Because it's technology that's going to help us face uh, the greatest uh, challenges of our time. As David Gatemborough said at COP26 in Glasgow, it will be an industrial revolution powered by millions of sustainable innovations that will give us a brighter future. Aside from medical challenges, like we've just seen, we have to develop inventors capa uh, capable of delivering more clean energy, combating food security, protecting water sources, mitigating the effects of climate change, and more. Just a few weeks ago, scientists released data showing that 2023 will be the hottest since records began. 2023, a year of heat waves, fires, and floods, a year in which one in every 12 people on this planet still lives in poverty with less than 2.50 US dollars per day and one in three people still have no access to clean water. Technological progress has never been more needed. And part of the answer relies on fostering new technologies that will answer these challenges, and there, of course, the patent system is a key element by, on the one hand, granting an exclusive right to market inventions that meet the three criteria of patentability, a right that attracts funding and investment and licensing possibilities, making it more likely that invention will indeed see the light of the day. And on the other hand, there's an obligation, a commitment to make the invention understandable for a person skilled in the art, ensuring that 
everyone can build on that work and make the next technological breakthrough or simply add incremental development to the technology. This is what powers progress. As an idea, it's beautiful in its simplicity, effective. It has an impact. And in one way or another, it's the reason why all of us involved in patents are here today. To a large degree, that system is working. Demand across the globe for patents is increasing. In Europe, almost a 3% increase in applications on average each year for the last 10 years. Even with the pandemic, there was no real downturn, just a temporary short leveling off. There's a, a record 193,000 uh, filings last year alone. In 2021, Australia also experienced an impressive 11% growth in patent filings. These are all numbers that paint a picture of a thriving innovation sector. Patents are contributing to our economies too. In the EU, industries that use IP rights intensively have directly and indirectly supported 40% of EU jobs, generated more than 80% of EU exports, and contributed to nearly half of the EU's GDP. To put this in perspective, this is equivalent to the combined GDP of Germany, Belgium, Luxembourg, Netherlands, and Poland. It's a similar story here in Australia, where businesses with IP rights account for 2.6 million jobs, around 51% of Australia's total exports, and 35% of Australian GDP. Patents are also supporting the actors that need supporting, the smaller entities who so often turn out to be powerhouses of innovation. In Europe, we know from our research that SMEs which file just one European patent increase the likelihood of future growth by 34%. And startups which file patent applications during the early growth stage are around five times more likely to secure funding. But we need to do more as we are falling short in our efforts to create a more sustainable society. As we cross the half halfway point of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development this year, it said that only 12% of SDGs are on track. Although low carbon energy tech has advanced rap rapidly in the last decade compared to fossil, fossil fuels, its adoption remains slow. What's more, around 35% of the technologies needed to achieve net zero emissions by 2050 are still in the prototype stage, facing a funding gap in clean tech ventures. And SMEs, which are likely to drive clean innovation, only contrib contribute a fifth of patent applications in Europe. Yes, yet they represent around 90% of businesses, businesses worldwide. So we have to ask ourselves, what do we have to do? And I know that, of course, there are other factors, state financing, RD financing, policy decisions, behavioral changes. But for all of us in IP, for all, all of us in patents who are here to play our part, what do we have to do to make sure that we are hitting those sustainable, sustainability targets? Well, today I want to put four points to you, four things that I do think are very important to help get things on track and to take the patent contract to the next level because clearly an extra effort is needed. Firstly, high quality. That's non-negotiable. Quality underpins sustainability. Legally robust, high-quality patents provide inventors with reliable rights they need to make financial commitments for research and development. A lot of people here will think that's a given, but it's not. There are challenges that patent offices across the world face when it comes to provide, providing dependable quality. And we have to keep investing to make sure that quality is added in the right direction. For example, we know that a key enabler of quality is a thorough and timely search. But the re reality is that if patent applications are growing, so is the prior art exponentially. And as the state of the art progresses, so does the complexity of the applications as they cut across different fields and include more and more types of technology. It's clear that patent offices the world over are going to have to address this issue 
Because if we don't, it could have serious effects on the quality of products and services. That's, how, that's why we have to continue, continue sharing patent documents, digitally of course, between different patent offices and develop more efficient, more powerful tools that are capable of analyzing the patent documents and data and giving us the most relevant documents at the search and examination phase. At the EPO, that means finding the most relevant documents from amo among the 1.5 billion technical records we hold, even in other languages, of course, and the ability to leverage more granular classification. For example, through the cooperative patent classification scheme in which Australia plays an important part. To keep getting better, we also have to explore how we ourselves can use emerging technologies, which is why we aim to advance collaboration with uh, IP Australia in artificial intelligence classification and exchanging insights on AI to optimize our operations. And of course, there should be no misunderstandings on quality. Unfortunately, we live in a society of increasing polemics, a world where arguments and viewpoints seem to be stuck at opposite ends of the spectrum. If we adopt that kind of policy on quality, we will never progress. Instead, we have to work towards shared definitions, shared ex expectations, a shared journey with shared obligations. This is the only way we can respond to our users' needs and why dialogue is so important which is why our Standing Advisory Committee has a dedica dedicated working group on quality, SAKEPO, that has a diverse and expansive membership, membership, 75 members from 42 countries, including Australia. But let me be very clear. If we are to take quality to the next level, we have to take a generational leap in the way the patent granting process is actually carried out. Because the patent grant process was, if we were not honest, designed for the age of steam. When an application would be filed, sent by horse or sheep, and then await a long response. Then back again, and so on, and so forth. A slow series of steps in which errors and corrections could mean a long, tedious, protracted uh, process. But digitization and more real-time interactions are not only helping to deliver better timeliness, but can also improve quality. The pandemic accelerated our plans for digitizing the patent process. Some 99% of that process is now paperless by vol volume. And it's giving us a new platform from which to progress even further, because now we have an opportunity for the process to be less sequential, more collaborative. Now it's not just examination that's carried out by our three-person divisions. Thanks to digitization, searches are now seen by three experts, which will increase quality. But this is also an opportunity to collaborate more with the applicant through our online services. This is the kind of closer collaboration that we should all, I believe, believe be striving for. But ultimately, what good are high quality patents if only a privileged few can use them? A sustainable future is an inclusive one, indeed. The two concepts are inseparable. So our challenge now is to make the patent system accessible to all. This is why the launch of the European patent with unitary effect wasn't just long overdue, it was necessary. It marks a turning point for inventors in accessing cross-border, cost-effective patent rights with higher legal certainty through a single renewal fee, in a single currency, under a single legal system paving the way to a single market of technology in Europe, covering 17 EU states with the hope that all 27 EU member states participate in countries in the future. Patent protection in this market, in this unitary market, is equivalent to a combined GDP of more than $15 trillion and can reach 600 million consumers. It's potentially a game changer for smaller innovators around the world looking to enter the European market more affordably and no longer needing to navigate the potentially complex and costly process of validating and maintaining patents in each country individually. The results are already starting to show. In just a few months, over 15 patents with unitary effect have been registered, 
over 100 of which come from Australia. Of those users who have opted for unitary effect, over four in 10 are from SMEs and research institutions. Compare that to the fact that SMEs only account for around a quarter of classical European patent applications. So we can already see the unitary patent is more popular with smaller applicants. But I also believe that a truly sustainable patent system, a sustainable society, is only possible when we teach everyone about patents, about their value, what they can do for a company, the benefits they deliver in terms of investments, fund, funding, and growth, and how patents can actually be obtained. But we are not there yet. The, last, the latest WIPO Pulse survey revealed that the Asia-Pacific region ranks amongst the lowest in appreciation of patents compared to other global regions, with only around 21% of respondents in the region acknowledge the positive economic impact of patents. The situation in Western Europe isn't, isn't much better, with only 29% recognizing patents' positive influence. We need to achieve a universal understanding of patent protection. So how do we change this and make patents an asset for the many and not the preserve of a few? Firstly, we have got to let people know that the information is there for others to build on. Right now, we've got the world's lar largest collection of patent data, which can be accessed by everyone, everywhere, completely free of charge through the EPO's online tool, Espasnet, including by users in Australia who visited more than 100 times last year, because it's an incredibly powerful resource, a database of the state of the art, which other inventors can use to avoid repeating work that's already been done, and instead build on the previous breakthroughs, keeping that invention cycle moving forward. But then we have also have to use that informa information to generate insight for the world innovation community, for investors and for policymakers, empowering them to make sound decisions, whether related to research, policy, or investment. That is how we go from patent information and patent knowledge to patent intelligence, deploying the information we hold for maximum impact. When the pandemic hit, for example, we introduced a fighting coronav coronavirus platform, providing inventors with search strategies for quick access to vital patent data on antiviral vaccines. This global platform has been accessed around 18,000 times. Encouraged by this success, a clean energy and firefighting platform has also been launched and now deliver data on relevant technologies within minutes. The bushfires, which raise across large areas of Europe and Australia every year, are a timely reminder of how important it is to transform data into real-world impactful solutions, why we need to keep developing new platforms for researchers tackling specific issues. So later this year, we will be extending the clean energies platform to include carbon capture and storage. We will follow that up in 2024 with search platforms on combating cancer, on space-related technologies and water technologies. Then 2025, we'll see the launch of platforms on the plastics of tomorrow and technologies to help achieve zero hunger, all of which we are developed to correspond to specific UN SDGs. For anyone who holds such vast amount of data, we also have an obligation to use that data to ge generate genuine insight, not just for researchers, but to produce reports and analysis that can be understood by everyone, to break down complex information into simple, digestible insights we clear takeaways, simple truths that can spur action, like the fact that women account for only one in seven inventors in Europe, quite simply, not enough, or that America is losing ground to other regions when it comes to the patenting of hydrogen technologies, and that every country lags a long way behind China when it comes to, to the patenting of wind turbines. But once we have the insight, once we have that knowledge, we have got to find a way to continually debate these emerging trends transparently so we can find the answers to these problems together. In Europe, we simply didn't have 
a permanent forum for that. So just a month ago, we have launched the Observatory on Patents and Technology to close that gap and give us an open platform where both private and public sector stakeholders can achieve a better understanding of what is happening and what we need to do to reach a more sustainable future across disciplines, across borders, cooperating closer with partners, including, of course, with the chief economist of IP Australia. You know, one of the observatory's first initiatives uh, was the Deep Tech Finder, a tool which combines business information with patent data. What it does effectively, it allows investors to detect promising ventures from over 7,500 European startups. But we would never have this, uh, made this a reality if we hadn't looked beyond our list of traditional partners. Which takes me to, the, to our fourth and final point. Cooperation, partnership, the networks we build. After all, the innovation community is global. Over half of the patent applications at the EPO come from outside Europe. And here in Australia, over 92% of patent applications originate from foreign ent entities. So we have got to think in terms of global opportunities and challenges. We cannot, we cannot hope to support a sustainable society with sustainable technologies if the patent system itself is not sustainable to begin with. Cooperation gives us the possibility to increase our efforts to raise knowledge and awareness in regions that have great potential for inventive activity, but which we aren't taking full advantage of the patent system. Africa, for example, which contributes just 0.6% of global patent. But given the right set of conditions can increase that contribution dramatically. Our training program with the African Regional Intellectual Property Organization in enhancing knowledge and skills in national patent offices and the knowledge transfer to Africa scheme is making use of Europe's patent library networks to explain businesses how to reap the benefits of patents. Another reality we have to confront is that in so many countries, increasing patent applications and limited resources are threatening to cause real backlogs. Delayed patent applications that might, for example, all the next big breakthrough in green tech. But if we allow DPO's products to be reused, we can help alleviate some of that pressure, freeing up resources in that specific country and inspiring businesses to invest in a country that uses high quality products. As a result, EPO's products currently touch markets that cover some 2.2 billion people. Markets, jurisdictions that also face similar challenges when it comes to the patent system. Think of AI. I've already mentioned how it can help in the actual examination process. But right now, it's also challenging fundamental concepts of the patent system, like inventorship. There have been rulings across the world on the Davos case about whether AI can be the named inventor, Germany, the UK, the US, New Zealand, and South Korea, the list goes on. And of course, in Europe, the decision on Davos required the inventor to be a human being, and the same as here in Australia. But of course, the debate on AI will continue, maybe even increase as society, society learns how to exploit new opportunities presented by AI. For example, using AI to generate patent documentation, which might destroy the novelty of an invention. And then consider just how much patent documentation could be generated. AI is not on the clock. It doesn't run out of energy. And if you instruct it to, it will just keep going and going and going fast, very fast. Yes, that calls on us to ramp up our efforts on effective AI-driven search tools, as I mentioned earlier. But AI issues generally also calls on us to work together. There are common challenges that call for common solutions. Of course, every patent office, every association and IP organization will have its own initiatives, its own ways of cooperating with different partners. And there are so many different ways to pursue common goals, data sharing, joint training, and so, all of which we also do. But the point here, is that we have to look for new opportunities, new partners, and also more innovative initiatives that can keep pace with the growing opportunities and challenges to pursue the principles of multilateralism, even at the time of increasing geopolitical tensions. It's the only way we'll find a path forward in an innovation ecosystem that is so deeply interconnected. 
So to conclude, quality, accessibility, knowledge, and awareness, and cooperation. These are, I believe, some of the most important attribu attributes of a patent system that forces the emergence of new technologies. Not the only attributes, for sure, but to me, certainly some of the most pertinent. As we undertake our journey, we always have to keep in mind inventors like Thomas and Nicholas, because the future lies in a patent system that can bring the full weight of this inventive talent to the causes where it is most needed. A system that tackles evolving challenges to make sure our society one day reaches that all important goals of sustainability. On that note, I will end here, but I'm of course happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antonio, and in particular for being so open to questions, and I'm sure you'll have many. Uh, to remind you, uh, those of you in the room, you can use the QR code that's on the screen on either side of us. Those of you online have the QR code there already, and I will be um, receiving your questions as they come in. Thank you very much. Uh, should anyone want to use a 20th century technology of raising the hand and a microphone, that is also possible. So don't feel precluded uh, from that. Not surprised. Antonio, you mentioned AI. In fact, you mentioned it a number of times and not surprisingly so. Uh, you mentioned a little bit about a role for AI in examination. But do you see it going beyond uh, assisting in the search function into the more substantive uh, conceptual aspects of innovation, uh, examination of innovation? I mean, yes. <laughs> yes? And I mean, I mean, would you like to elaborate? <laughs> I mean, you, you all know you here better than me. No, of course, I mean, I mean uh, we have a, a, a very, a very, um, um, how would I phrase this? We do things at an order, uh, TPO. So uh, we've been generating tools first for giving access, for instance, of our examiners to um, Asian prior art. OK? Uh, and the growth in China applications is two digits now for the past years. Not having an access to prior art uh, is not an option if you want to have a quality search. Um, then we, we built um, tools um, that help us in classifying documents. Okay. From these tools that help us classifying uh, documents, we moved to, we made an upgrade of the tool to make sure that the tools can help us routing, uh, routing the files to the right, invent, uh, right examiner and build the, this three person division accordingly with the technologies that are there in the, in the patent applications. From there, we moved to, moved to search. Uh, all these were manual tasks. All of these were manual tasks. Of course, we had two people speaking Mandarin and one Cantonese in the office, but that was not enough. Um, can you imagine what is the percentage of citations, citations of uh, Chinese literature, patent literature on our search reports today? Can somebody give me a percentage? How much? 25. Not bad. A little bit more? 40. Yeah, who said 40? <laughs> a glass of champagne for the gentleman. <laughs> there you go. Um, and, and from there, from, from sorry? OK. OK. <laughs> and, 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 and now we are, we are still working. Uh, now, I mean, we are, we're about to replace a uh, 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 notorious uh, tool that we developed over the years which is called uh, Epoch, and, and, and when we, we, we basically offer this tool um, to non-member states, uh, we call it EpochNet, but we're just about now to replace by um, Elasticsearch AI-driven tool, which is called a, a ABS, and a Sarah based search, and that will happen in the next two years. Um, but it's no, not, not over. Now we are looking out to bring interfaces AI interfaces that will allow just exactly what I said, which is to profile the results of the, the, the AI generated search, uh, to profile it accordingly with the, the person which is searching, whether the person is a researcher, investigator, 
or the person is an examiner, or the person is a patent attorney, or the person is even, I don't know, a, a, a person uh, conducting investigative work in the media, or even policymaker, or then venture capitalists, or so that's why we are doing that. But now we will, we will in, in the next four or five years, we're going to turn to examination. Having said so, the search is still conducted by examiners, okay? <laughs> okay? So, and we have a human centric approach to, to AI tools, but then we will look, obviously, at the examination in the examination area. Particularly because we still operate on the basis of tools who have been developed in 10 years ago or even more, 14 years ago, for a transitional phase that would bring a dig digital file, which we still do not have at EPO. So, we follow this order, and we will continue to follow this order. And I do believe that for the next years to come, don't ask me as many, the AI tools will be there to assist the examiner in conducting search and examination. But in a ma machine learning system, how long will it take for the machine to have learned everything that human being knows? I ask you that question. I, I read the other day that in a university in somewhere in the US, um, they have developed for this quantum computer that is 10,000 10, times more powerful than the best computers that we have today. And uh, just injecting in that quantum computer whatever uh, humanity has created, whatever humanity has invented, so you tell me, how long will it take? Not for, I don't know, the machine. I, I don't want to finish that sentence. <laughs> I'll let you finish that sentence. Okay. No, no, I'll just ask the questions if you don't but mind. We, need this. <laughs> um, we have many here. Um, uh, let me just ask this one here. Uh, in fact, there was one back here I was wanted to start with. Um, you mentioned the need for the patent system to support sustainable development. Uh, we know that indigenous knowledge mm -hmm. holds the solutions to the climate crisis we are facing. Mm. It goes on to say, yet the patent system mm. disregards and in fact causes harm to indigenous knowledge and the holders of indigenous knowledge. How do you suggest the IP system address this issue? I think, I think that Michael has been interested by, by the government to look for solutions for that, and that's what he, Michael and his team are looking um, very much in, into that. I think that um, we agree that protecting uh, genetic resources and traditional knowledge, it's very important in Australia and in other regions, other countries in the globe. The thing, we, I think that, that if I may, the, 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 the Michael and his team have come to a, a crossroads where they do see, uh, they do analyze all the IP rights that exist from GIs, uh, collect, uh, collective trademarks, uh, copyrights, uh, uh, design, uh, and, and, and they come to an understanding that the, no IP rights as, as, as design can ensure a perpetual, they say per, 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 perpetual, a perpetual protection of the TK, and that's exactly what, what, what Michael has been mandated to. So we had a very interesting discussion. I think that bringing different IP rights together, you could develop a sui generis IP right that could, could ensure just that. But the first step, what should be the first step before we enact a law? Because, you know, we enact laws and nothing changes, as we all know. So. I mean, we need, I think, first to devise a way to create a databases that identify all these genetic resources and all these, I mean, traditional knowledge in a way that it is publicly visible that the TK exists, but you don't go into, you should go then into almost a trade secret area where, where the, the TK is, is described, but not accessible, because if it is accessible, then it's going to be stolen. And you don't make it public for it to be stolen. So, I mean, Michael will answer much better to this question, but I know that he's looking very hard. He's been mandated by, by the government, and uh, I know that the teams are looking at innovative uh, solutions through the innovative IP lab or 
I don't remember the exact name, but yeah. So he's the right guy to ask the question. He's the right guy. And I'll just, for those of you online who can't see who Antonio is pointing to, it's uh, Michael Schwager, Director General of IP Australia. Um, we have a 20th century posed question over here. <laughs> Thanks for that. It's uh, <coughs> Matthew Lucas from Davies Collison Cave, Australia slash Singapore. Um, in 2018, uh, a program was set up to, val to be able to validate your European patent into Cambodia. Yes. Do, do you see that program being extended to other ASEAN countries? I mean, we've been talking for years, uh, as the leaders of the IP offices, that we should not duplicate the work, right? I mean, we should reuse the work we do. Right, particularly because at the time we, we we started discussions, huge backlog had been generated in many many countries, many many countries. So, we launched the PPH. Wow. Wow. Um, we developed, for instance, a new product when I arrived to reinforce my partnership, which is a very good program in the sense that. Um, there's no legal commitment to reuse the EPO's products. It's a voluntary reuse of EPO's products. And of course, there's a validation agreement. The EPO is the only international organization, as you know, provide uh, search reports and, and written opinions on the patentability of the invention and, 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 and uh, in-depth examination. And we have a 4,000 strong team of examiners covering 340 technical fields to do so. How many offices in the world can compete with that? And the EPO is an organization that can celebrate international agreements. Validation agreement is an international agreement. And they, it, it offers today more flexibility than it used in the past in the sense that, for instance, if countries in Asia or in other regions of the world would, would like to start a pilot in certain fields of technology and then assess the quality of the products of the, the EPO, we could, we could achieve that. So that would free resources from that specific office, maybe to support better the research centers in conducting search in cooperation with the patent attorneys. So yes, I think that the validation agreement is a great thing. And can you imagine, it has been devised in a diplomatic convention in 1963, 1973, the 5th of October. The 5th of October, 73, the founding fathers approved the provision that allows uh, the council to try the president to start negotiations leading to a validation agreement and then agree on the final text of the validation agreement. If we were not to duplicate it, uh, resources, if we were not to duplicate efforts, if we really mean what we say, and if we take into account that EPO is the only international organization, again, I will repeat, that provides substantial examination strong with a 4,000 examiner team, I think this, this at least should be seriously considered. Yes, thank you for the question. Um, one from online. Could you explain more how increasing global patents from Africa from 0.6% achieves sustainable development, especially in relation to loss of tax revenue through illicit financial flows or the export of mineral resources for green tech? Yeah, I, 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 will, <laughs> I will deal with the first part of the question, not the second part. Uh, for that, I would call for the chief economist of, uh, of AP Australia to answer to that. It's not about the patents. I mean, I try to make the, the, the point. I mean, it's, I mean, we talk too much about patents. It's about technologies. I mean, if we were to save this planet, we need to change behavior and we need technologies that we do not have today. And the patent is just a tool to achieve that. A tool, there's many, many other tools. So the K to Africa, knowledge transfer to Africa, is mainly to train, we have six, creating 16 centers in Africa, but run by Africans, not run by us. And what we teach them we teach them about the patent system, of course, but we teach them how to search that database, that is passionate to contain 150 million documents. The vastest oh, technological libraries are ours, are ours. We contain the technologies since, I don't know, two centuries ago, or even more. 
Abraham Lincoln, uh, they found in the Congress, the, 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 the Library of Congress, a creative uh, uh, a text from Abraham Lincoln. And it's not about a patent, patent, patent. It's not a religion patent, right? It's about the technology. It's, it's to develop this muscle in these universities, this African Research Center for M2, this, 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 this uh, K2A centers, to help the researchers, the African researchers, the Af African uh, uh, teachers to navigate through this vast uh, technological uh, uh, databases and then to be able to bring new technology and then maybe or not they can decide to write a beautiful public uh, scientific paper that's also one, one way to go or to do both thank you what are your perspectives on the trips waiver of the covid-19 vaccines and medicines which was opposed by the European Union, but strongly supported by the majority of other governments, world governments. I mean, I'm going to be very politically in, in, uh, incorrect, but I'm like this, okay? I worked for a minister, was very tough on me, okay? He said to me one day, I met him in the restaurant, and he said, Antonio, I want you to deliver a trademark in 24 hours. I said, was the Minister of Justice I said, it's not possible. I said, what, what, what is not possible? What, what, what is not possible? Portugal was in a phase where we were moving from a situation where it took like six months to create a company to a 24 company. And now it's like one hour, one hour. So we want to couple the company name with the brand, the trademark. I said, I said look, we have an opposition period of three months. <laughs> and he said to me, look, if you want to change things, I changed the law. I said, please not. <laughs> so I, we came to this creative solution that I asked my examiner to look for, to create brands uh, and then to conduct the search to see if the brand was free to, to be protected by trademark. We sent these this, this, this clean trademarks to the company register. We made an MOU saying that they could apply and with zero fees and they would send them back to us so that the applicant could, of course, ask for a company name that has the same name of the brand without changing the law. Without cha that was my point. Now, you change the law. Basically, if you read the trips, a lot of provisions are people that think that are not there, they are there. We need to transfer knowledge. We need to share knowledge. Um, <laughs> if only 21 to 29 percent of respondents in democratic societies in the Asia Pacific and EU see patents as making a positive contribution, rather than trying to convince the majority to see the light mm. and appreciate the value of patents, is it time to redesign the system to reflect their expectations? I mean, Paris Convention dates from when? Another glass of champagne for? <laughs> 1880? Okay, end of the 19th century, it's okay for a glass of champagne. It was like 1883, I think, but okay. Okay, how many attempts to change the patent system since? So how, how many years have passed? A lot. A lot of attempts. So, I mean, the thing here is that we need to recognize it's something that I say, again, in politically incorrect professor, is I've, I've been participating in conference for the past 20 years, in IP conference, in the, and I see the same people. It's horrible. <laughs> it's, uh, and they say me, which is even more horrible. The only thing that changes is in the, in, the, in, the, in, 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 in the road they sit. So as I said to Michael the other day, now for the next years will be Michael sitting in the first row, and maybe in 10 years he will be sitting, sitting in the fourth row. And then, Five years, then maybe in the second row, then maybe we'll decide to change lives. But, but I mean, we need to democratize, we need to simplify the patent system. It's so complex, it's an absurdity. It's of a complexity that it takes an engineer that, that learns a lot to understand it. So we need to simplify it. We need, I mean, to really understand that we have a diversity issue. We need to make it transparent and we make, need to make it more democratic. And then let's talk and see in the, if in the next survey, these 21 and 27 will not be 40. 
because that tool is there for more than two centuries, or no more, a little bit less than two centuries, I exaggerated. And there's been many attempts to change it, and nobody really managed to change it. And the probability is on the side that it will not be changed, but as I told you, you don't need to change the law to change things. Many times we change the law and things remain the same. So let's not stop being about changing the law. Let's talk about changing things. <laughs> How do we make the IP enforcement system more accessible for SMEs? Yeah. Infringement action is not for the faint-hearted. Just maintaining a watch on the market for infringement is a major understatement. Anyway, how do we change, how do we make the IP enforcement system more accessible for SMEs? I mean, there's a classical way, which is fee reduction. All right, that's the easiest one. We're about to change the fee structure if our administrative council in December, the 6th or the 7th December agrees to, which will provide uh, further to all the discounts that we offer to SMEs and research centers, a 30% discount uh, for micro entities. In Europe, it's entities that um, have a uh, business volume of less than 1 million euros and less than 10, 10 employees and research centers. So this is a, cl a classical answer. I think that the real answer the real answer is twofold. One that many of us have tried in the past with no success, which is called mediation and arbitration, alternative ways of, uh, for dispute resolutions. Uh, and I think, uh, for instance, the Unified Patent Court, uh, which is a court that presides over the European Patent with Unitary Effect, as a mediation center, med arbitration mediation center that now will be brought into life throughout 2024. The other one is of our responsibility here, yeah? I want to tell you which one it is. And one that the Americans are much better than us. It's the pro bono. OK, pro bono scheme, guys. OK? So we need to find, find ways the patent offices. It's not easy eh, to set up a pro bono uh, scheme. I don't uh, underestimate the complexity of the issue, but it's easier than the uh, genetic resources and traditional knowledge, believe me. You will see that. Um, <laughs> but I think that the pro bono is the solution, and it should be our collective and individual responsibility to give a little bit of our time, and us, the patent office, our resources, to help people who are who receive a cease and deceive 101 letter to be able to defend their rights. So, but the gentleman doesn't agree. We are in democracy, thank God. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, you have great hopes for making patents more accessible and more used by innovative businesses. Mm -hmm. This will lead to more patents in the world. <laughs> Can there be too many patents for businesses to know, to know their freedom to operate? Or will technology solve that? Yeah. Is there too many Australian dollars or too many American dollars? Is there a limit to euros? Patents are a currency. It's a currency of the 21st century. So. I don't think that making them more accessible will ne necessarily have a huge impact on the huge growth that Francis Gurry described to you when he was giving lectures throughout the world. I mean, global patent growth is insane. And I don't think that we should be worried in making it more accessible to those who have n n never never could benefit from it. I don't think that that will impact overwhelmingly the, the overall volumes of, of patent. I do believe that we need to make the patent system more transparent, more accessible. We need to bring diversity. We need to simplify it, please. And we need to reach out to parts of the society that we never did and explain and explain and explain. 
That's what I do believe. As AI creates efficiencies, how will the EPO ensure that the savings are passed to your customers? By provi providing high quality products and services. <laughs> you know, it's as simple as that. I have a cost structure. <coughs> Okay, and this cost structure, 90% of my cost structure is salaries and something that you do not have, which is social security and pensions, not only of our people, but the families of our people. Okay? Okay, so that means that per year, if my budget is 2.4 billion, Two billion, a little bit less than two billion. We need to discount like half, 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 half a billion. 1.5 billion for sure. 1.5 billion goes to pay, you know, salaries, security, social security for my staff, their families, pensioners, and their families. So this is my cost structure. I don't have only salaries, okay? I have long-term liabilities. I, will, I need to put this organization slash this office in a situation to be, to be able to fulfill its committee in the next 20 years. And that's what we're trying to do. We're not even trying because we still have a surplus of 400 million. And then you would say, oh, you have a surplus of 400 million. Why don't you decrease the fees? Actually, I'm decreasing fees. I talked about this restructuring of, of our fees, OK? Uh, Nelly could come here and explain you the, the new fee structure. But this 400 million, you know what we do with it? You think that we put it on our pockets? No. I mean, 60% of it today goes to a treasury, fund, a treasury fund that is was 3 billion of euros today. And the remaining 40% go to reserve fund of the Social Security Pension Scheme. The issue was 12 billion. And these two funds are there to cover the long-term liabilities of the office because the worst thing that could happen to this organization is that it enters into a structural deficit and it loses its independence because member states need to step in and they will never step in to basically pay our salaries and pay our pensions. So as far as I can, as far as I can, I will reduce the fees. But you need to understand that when I'm hit by an inflation of 12%, my costs ra raise, 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 rise, there I go, rise by this 12%. So I need to find efficiency gains, of course, and we do, but I will need to raise also the fees. Thank you. Now, I'm just checking if anyone would like to pose a question from the room using the microphone. Yes, we have one here. <clears throat> Uh, thank you. Uh, just uh, recently, the EU Commission has made a proposal for reforming the regulation of standard essential patents. And in this proposal, one of the recommendations is to establish a competent center under the EU Intellectual, Pro EU Intellectual Property o Office that manages the registry and the uh, uh, essentiality check and provides objective information regarding every get royalties to implementers and uh, this attracts some criticism as uh, you know if the EU uh, IPO has a relevant expertise to do this job since the uh, EU IPO is mainly in charge of the issue of EU trademark and design rights uh, indeed it's surprised you know it is not the EU patent uh, European patent office do this job uh, could you comment on this issue and uh, the EU reform proposal on SEPs thank you I think you both uh, uh, asked the question and provide the answer. <laughs> so thank you very much. I mean, I, had to, I, I, I came public uh, on this matter, which I mean, normally I do not do these things, but I heard also on the first speech of the president of the Unified Patent Court saying that this proposal could, be, could infringe uh, human rights access to justice because during these six months, uh, um, no one can have access to uh, any national court or the, the unified patent court questions uh, fun fundamental rights. And also it's a little bit, yeah, like you say, you have a, a beautiful agency in Alicante, uh, which, is, which deals with trademarks and design, and then you give this such important competence uh, to the UIPO. When you have a unified patent court that can deal with these matters, 
and has de will develop a mediation and arbitration center. So, and we, we hold the register of, of, of uh, all, the, all these matters. So, I mean, I don't want further to comment, but at the end of the day, I mean, whatever happens, uh, whatever happens, the, ev the expertise or most important part of the expertise, if, if that legislation were to be born, will need to come from the EPO again. So why going to the UIPO when the expertise is at EPO? Yes, but you answer your own question, yeah. That's your own question, what can I say? Uh, here's one that doesn't have the answer attached to it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you consider that a second tier patent system could bridge the gap between the existing design and patent systems and stimulate innovation? Or do you consider a second tier patent system would have a negative effect on patent quality? What do you consider to be a second tier system? The utility so something models? Like a utility, utility model models. or petty patent system. Yeah. Me personally? Yes, I think it's tricky. I never, I never, I, I, I listen. One of the invention who generated uh, more money, I mean, at least 20 years ago, was the Tetra Pak. You know what the Tetra Pak is? So we used to transport milk in bottles. And then someone has the idea to do, you know, a square packaging. And then we multiply by three or by four the capacity of a truck to transport milk. Would that qualify for what? You tell me. A patent? or a utility model. Who are we to say that this invention deserves to be patented or this invention deserves only a utility model? Whether it has novelty, inventive step, and, in, uh, and, and industrial applicability, and then it qualifies whatever you think about the value of the patent for a patent, or it doesn't, and that's it. And then, how to differentiate a utility model system from a patent system. So many, many countries, what they did is that exclude pharmaceuticals and biotechnology from the utility model. Why? Because the utility model had no, no, no examination. And that's why it was faster. It was faster because there was no examination. So what is the value of the title that you grant if there's no search and examination? So, me personally, but I, I agree that, of course, others can have a totally different idea than me, but I think that a petty pattern is a petty pattern. <laughs> <laughs> there are many more questions here, um, but I am going to respect the uh, commitment we made to you both online and in the room that we would finish by seven, and we've, we've nearly met that uh, at 7.04. So what I am going to do is leave the uh, questions now with that where we got to uh, and call upon uh, Michael Schwager, the Director General of IP Australia, to uh, formally bring this evening to a close. So it's my pleasure um, to be able to just thank, uh, thank President Kampenosh for his presentation this evening and for so generously and so frankly uh, answering the many questions that we have. It's, um, it's uh, great to see the support that EPO gives our inventors um, through things like the awards and the video that you saw uh, this morning, or Professor, uh, sorry, this evening, but Professor Nick Opie and his team um, with the Stent Road. Uh, and bringing those signals out of the brain is such, a, such an inspirational a way to look at the contribution that we, as um, stakeholders in the IP ecosystem, how we contribute to that sort of success. So congratulations to, um, to Nick Opie and his team, um, but I think also the contribution we make as the people, the custodians of the IP system, can be proud also that we are ensuring that people, that humanity, benefits from great ideas. And I think that was a key part of what we heard today from Antonio, was that it's not just the economic gains, but it's the social gains to humanity that is absolutely critical in what we do. 
and that gives us the intrinsic reward for what we contribute to society through the IP system. Um, part of that is absolutely making sure that there is accessibility to the IP system, the constant communication about what the IP system can do for entrepreneurs, for small business, for inventors, so that they can access that and help to commercialise the ideas to the benefits of all humanity. And that's something that we need to be very, very proud of. Um, and associated with that is just how valuable the data is that we sit on. In the 21st century, data is an enormously valuable currency and that we are the custodians of centuries of technology data, and that is a national asset. In fact, it's a global asset, and that it is our duty to make the most of that. So um, the key to all of that, of course, is collaboration. Not just collaboration here in Australia, but collaboration internationally. Um, I would particularly like to thank Antonio um, I'm trying to recall, but I suspect Antonio might be the first head of an IPO to visit Australia in at least the last five years, um, with exceptions possibly to my colleagues from New Zealand. Um, so uh, the commitment that the EPO has to collaboration is genuine, as you can see from the discussion here tonight. Uh, I would really like to thank everyone involved in putting on the Francis Gurry Lectures um, they are a fantastic contribution to our discussions here in Australia um, and internationally through uh, the magic of technology. Uh, and I'd very much like to thank Antonio and Andrew for the discussion this evening. Thank you.